Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are gonna be covering chapter 16 over development stem cells and cancer from Campbell's Biology and Focus. So we're gonna start off with a big overview. I just wanna point out that this chapter is kind of bogged down with a whole bunch of details and experiments. And I just want my kids to kind of know like the overarching theme here about development and how all of the things that we've been talking about, how DNA replicates, how you make transcripts on mRNA, how you actually make a functional protein that's gonna go on and do a job, like how you control gene expression then by um, upregulating or downregulating the uh, transcription and translation of certain genes on your chromosomes. I want you to tie all of that into how life develops. So don't get too bogged down by all of the details on this, but I do just wanna point that out that it does kind of get particularly specific, but I want you to think about the overarching themes here. So we're gonna start off with our overview, so orchestrating life's processes. Um, so the development of a fertilized egg into an adult requires a precisely regulated program of gene expression. Now gene expression is what we've been talking about, how you can express some traits in certain cells and not in others. Well, that's how we get cell specialization. So understanding this program has um, <clears throat> progressed mainly by studying model organisms. So we use organisms like we like to use uh, fruit flies, we like to use plants, we like to use bacteria, things that have a very short generation time that we can easily manipulate genes for. Um, stem cells are key to developmental uh, process, so we're gonna be studying stem cells towards the end. And then orchestrating proper gene expression by all cells is crucial for life. So obviously if you don't have all cells communicating and orchestrating, you know, which cells are going to express which genes and regulate all of that, you're not going to create a fully functioning organism. So it's really important that everything is on the same page. Okay, um, so here we just have an image that starts off your whole, um, you know, your textbook at the very beginning with the prompt that um, what regulates the precise pattern of gene expression in the developing wing of a fly embryo. So that's what you see here. This is a fly embryo. And we're gonna go through how gene expression is occurring in developing cells. Okay, so um, we're gonna start off with a program of differential gene expression leads to the uh, different cell types in a multicellular organism. So you know that we as multicellular organisms have a whole bunch of different tissues. You know that cells are the basic unit of life and our cells make up tissues, tissues make up our organs, organs make up organ systems and so on. And we have 12 organ systems that make us up as functioning human beings. Right, so obviously all of these different basic units of life, the cells, they have to be differentiated, which just means that there's different types of them that will go on to form different types of tissues and so on. So that's what this is talking about. So a fertilized egg gives rise to many different cell types, right? It's not like you just go through mitosis and you just create a whole bunch of fertilized egg cells, right? You have differentiation occurring. Um, cell types are organized successively into tissues, organs, organ systems, and whole organisms, which is what I was just talking about. Those are the levels of classification of life. Um, gene expression orchestrates the developmental program of animals. So we're gonna go into how gene expression is going to help us create these different types of cells. So genetic program for embryonic development. So the transformation from a zygote, so a zygote is just a fertilized egg to an adult results from cell division, cell differentiation and morphogenesis. So morpho is referring to a shape and genesis is the beginning. Right, um, so we're gonna go through cell division, like I said, with mitosis, but then at some point you have to have cell differentiation occurring to start branching off to make different types of tissues. And then morphogenesis is going to be kind of like creating like the axes and the different regions of the body. Okay, so this picture is just illustrating to you um, a fertilized egg of an animal to an animal, right? So there's only about four days that exist between these two different stages of this life cycle for this tadpole here. So obviously in that amount of time, a lot is going to change. Right, so you have a fertilized egg all the way to a newly hatched tadpole and there's a lot of differentiation that has occurred between our zygote and the fully formed organism. Obviously this is gonna go on to be an adult frog, but now we have a functioning organism. Okay, so cell differentiation is a process by which cells become specialized in structure and function. And we know that as an overarching theme for anatomy and biology, is that structure dictates the function, right? So how it's shaped is going to be an indicator of what it's going to go do. So the physical processes that give an organism its shape constitute morphogenesis. So again, that's like the beginning of like the shape. It's the development of the form of an organism and all of its structures, the overall shape. So um, differential gene expression results from genes being regulated differently in different types of cells. So in our last chapter, we talked about how gene expression is controlled, how you can, you know, transcribe certain regions of a gene or of a DNA uh, sequence versus not others, 
Um, you have operons and our like prokaryotes and, and things that we were talking about in our last chapter. So we've looked at how you can have gene expression um, being controlled um, you know, through various mechanisms, but now we're going to see in each cell type, there also is going to be a huge difference in how each of these genes are going to be either expressed or repressed. Okay, um, and then materials in the egg can set up gene regulation that's carried out as the cell divides. So cytoplasmic determinants are going to be the first thing we're going to be talking about and inductive signals. So an egg's cytoplasm, right? So the egg is our fertilized egg. That's where we're starting off as one cell. So it contains RNA, proteins, and other substances that are distributed unevenly in an unfertilized egg. Okay, um, cytoplasmic determinants are maternal substances in the egg that are gonna influence early development. So that's gonna influence the beginning of cell differentiation. So as the zygote divides by mitosis, which we're used to, mitosis is making identical cells, right? But you don't always want to make identical cells. You're going to start to differentiate later. But as the zygote divides through mitosis, making copies of the cells, the resulting cells can contain different cytoplasmic determinants because remember that they are uneven, unevenly distributed in our egg. So then once we have a fertilized egg, they're still unevenly distributed. So we have our cytoplasmic determinants that are going to be split into you know, the cytoplasm of our newly dividing cells. So now you're gonna have, it's a differential in our gene expression because you have these different determinants in each of the newly created cells after mitotic division. Um, so that's kind of what this picture here is showing you. Um, basically, you have the unfertilized egg that has these molecules floating around in the cytoplasm that you can see in the picture. Um, so these are encoded by the mother's gene. So it's come from the maternal because obviously that's where the egg came from. Um, that are going to help to influence development of the embryo. So um, a lot of the cytoplasmic determinants, like the ones that are shown in the picture, are widely um, unevenly distributed um, around the egg, around the cytoplasm. So then after fertilization and mitotic divisions, the cell nuclei of the embryo um, are exposed to different sets of cytoplasmic determinants. And as a result, the expression of genes in each of those cells is going to be different because you have these different um, cytoplasmic determinants that are there to influence what's going to happen. And then the second picture here is showing you um, induction by nearby cells. So cells can influence each other of what they're going to become as well. <clears throat> so the cells at the bottom of the um, early embryo depicted in this image um, are going to be releasing these little chemical signals to signal nearby cells to change the gene expression. Because if you're trying to create a certain type of tissue, it's obviously multiple types of cells, right? But if you have each cell that's going to become the same type of tissue, well, then you don't create any of the others. So there's these like predetermined mechanisms that um, allow cells to signal other cells like, hey, I'm going to go off and be this kind of tissue. You need to go off and be this kind of tissue or to recruit more of the same types of tissues. Uh, the other major source of developmental information is the environment around the cell, and especially signals from nearby embryonic cells. Um, so that process is induction. So that's what we were just looking at here in this side. Um, that's induction. So the signal molecules from embryonic cells um, cause transcriptional changes in nearby target cells. So like I said, they're influencing what is being expressed in the cells around them by releasing these signals to then control the cells around them. That's induction. Um, <clears throat> Thus, the interactions between cells induce differentiation of specialized cell types. So like I said, either to recruit more of that cell type or to create a different type of cell. Okay, so sequential regulation of gene expression during cellular differentiation. So determination commits a cell irreversibly to its final fate. So determination and differentiation are two different processes. Okay, but determination comes first. Determination like determines the type of cell and then differentiation comes second. And that kind of becomes like a little bit more specific for specialization. Okay, so um, I think it gives you an example in a few slides. Okay, so differentiation of cell types. So today um, determination is understood in terms of molecular changes. Um, the expression of genes for tissue specific proteins. And then the first evidence of differentiation is the production of mRNA for those proteins. Because remember that this will mean that you're gonna go on and create those proteins, right? Um, eventually, differentiation is observed as changes in the cellular structure. And that of course is going to be based off of the proteins that are actually created. 
So to study muscle cell determination, so that's, remember that's coming first, researchers grew embryonic precursor cells in culture and then analyzed them. And then they identified several master regulatory genes, um, <clears throat> the products of which commit the cells to becoming a skeletal muscle. So this is what's actually the commitment step. So it's becoming skeletal muscle, right? So this one that we're going to look at in the example is myOD. So we're going to look at this example to look at differentiation versus determination. Okay, so that's what this is showing you here. So up at the top, it's talking about um, like determination. So like starting off like in the um, like this first set here. So, and everything that goes along with it with the master regulatory genes and other specific genes, right? So basically <clears throat> it's saying that this is determination. So the signals from other cells are actually gonna lead to the activation of this master regulatory gene here that you can see called MyOD. And the cells are going to then make the MyOD protein because you're activating the transcription of that, um, that gene. So you're going to create that protein, the MyOD protein which is a specific transcription factor that's going to act as like an activator. So it's gonna go and activate. So the cell becomes a myoblast. So it's myOD, it produces a myoblast cell and it's irreversibly committed to actually becoming a skeletal muscle cell. Where differentiation comes in, we have differentiation in like the latter half, right? Cause this is determined and here fully differentiated, you can see from the labels. So in differentiation, you have those myOD proteins um, that are gonna stimulate the myOD gene even further, because remember they're acting as an activator and activate the other genes that are encoded for other muscle specific transcription factors that are needed, um, which in then are then going to activate genes for muscle proteins. And then our um, myOD is also going to turn on the genes that block the cell cycle, stopping cellular division. And then the non-dividing myoblasts that you've created are going to fuse to actually form a mature multinucleated muscle cell to create these muscle fibers, right? So there's determination is a commitment step. And then you have the actual fully differentiation, which will eventually give rise to your fully formed muscle fibers. So that's what's happening here. Okay, next we're gonna talk about apoptosis, which is a really important part of development. It's an important part of life as a whole. So it's like program cell suicide, essentially. So it's a type of program cell death. Um, so while most cells are differentiating in a developing organism, some are actually being programmed to die. Like, hey, you're, you've served your purpose, now you're gonna die. And we're just talking about particular cells. So apoptosis is best understood as a type of program cell death. I also like to just call it cell suicide. Okay, so apoptosis also occurs in a mature organism and cells that are infected, damaged, or at the end of their functional lives. Basically, it's like for the greater good. Instead of then dividing those cells that have these damaged parts or worn out parts, then they're just going to die through apoptosis. Okay, um, but we're going to look at how it is pre-programmed. So during apoptosis, DNA is actually all broken up. The organelles and other cytoplasmic components are all fragmented. So everything's breaking apart so then it can't be like a functional unit anymore. The cell is going to become multi-lobed and its contents are going to be packaged up into little vesicles. So essentially you're having like um, exocyte, hello. You're having like exocytosis kind of like all over the place. Like you have this like lobulated cell that will like pinch off to form like vesicles that will then go and be engulfed by scavenger cells. And apoptosis is actually helping to protect neighboring cells from damage by nearby dying cells. So apoptosis is essential to development and maintenance in all animals. It's also known to occur in fungi and yeast. And in vertebrates, um, apoptosis is essential for normal nervous system development and morphogenesis of the hands and feet, which is something that we're gonna look at in just an example, in, in a picture in just a few minutes. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, cool. So this is actually like the formation of like, hands, feet, paws, claws, things like that. So um, in like mice, humans, other mammals, um, things like that, you have an embryonic region that develops into the hands and feet of these organisms. It's initially like this like solid structure that you can see here. And then apoptosis actually eliminates the cells in between the digits, like in between like the fingers or the little pads of your feet or whatever um, to actually create your digits. So here in these regions, you have these like light colored cells. 
that are all going through apoptosis in order to create your digits. So apoptosis is actually what allows you to have, you know, separate fingers instead of like webbed hands. And sometimes people do have like webbed fingers slightly or webbed toes. And it's just because apoptosis didn't happen all the way through all of the cells that were connecting your digits together. So that's pretty cool. Um, next, we're going to talk about pattern formation, which gets a little weird when we're talking about like flies. So um, pattern formation is setting up the body plan. So this is how you know, like front from back and so like anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, left and right, uh, like medial, lateral directions of the body, right? So pattern formation is the development of a spatial organiza organization of our tissues and our organs. Um, in animals, the pattern formation begins with the establishment of the major axes, like I was saying. So that's dorsal and ventral, so like the front of your body versus the back of your body, which is also like um, you have anterior towards the head, posterior towards the tail, um, left and right sides of the body, up and down of the body, right? Um, so these are the major axes that are gonna be developed here. And then you have positional information, which uh, we have the molecular cues that are going to control the pattern formation. And it tells the cell its location relative to the body axes and the neighboring cells. So the pattern formation has been extensively studied in fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster. So like I said, we're gonna be talking about fruit flies a whole lot. They're very simple organisms. They grow very quickly. Their larvae develop very quickly. It's easy to go through mating with them. So that's why they're like a model organism for us. Um, so combining anatomical, genetic, and biochemical approaches, researcher, researchers have discovered developmental uh, principles uh, common to many other species, including humans. So by studying the fruit flies and by studying, you know, the pattern formations and things like that that are established in fruit flies, we can actually apply a lot of the same principles to other organisms, including ourselves as humans. So we're going to talk about the life cycle of a Drosophila, so of a fruit fly. Uh, the fruit flies and other arthropods have a modular structure um, composed of an ordered series of segments. Their bodies are little segmented pieces, and this is most like obvious on their um, abdomens. Um, in Drosophila, cytoplasmic determinants in the unfertilized egg determine the axes before fertilization. So remember that the cytoplasmic determinants are not evenly distributed. They are kind of like randomly distributed all around that egg. And then when you go through mitotic division, some of these cells are going to have more of one determinant than the other. That's kind of how you get the different axes developing. Okay, so here's an image of that. So um, you have the adult fly over here. And like I said, these are the different body axes that we're dealing with. So the adult fruit fly has a segmented body. Um, the multiple segments make up each of the three main body parts, like the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen. And the body axes are sh axes are shown um, with the arrows here to show you if you're not in anatomy, like where all these different um, locations are, right? And then in our other picture, we have the one through five for the developmental stages from egg to larva, which then the larva would grow up and become the adult, right? So you have the egg developing within the ovarian follicle, you have an unfertilized egg, you have a fertilized egg, you have a segmented embryo, and then the larval stage. So in Drosophila egg, um, they develop in the female's ovary and they're surrounded by ovarian cells called nurse cells and follicle cells. And then after fertilization, embryonic development results in a segmented larva, um, which then goes through three stages. And then eventually the larva forms a cocoon, um, then it goes through metamorphosis and develops into a fly. Okay, we're going to look at the genetic analysis of early development, um, scientific inquiry. So there's a couple scientists here. I'm not going to pretend to know how to say their names. I can say Lewis. So these scientists, in conjunction with Lewis, won a Nobel Prize for 1995 um, for decoding the pattern formation in Drosophila. So that's like the body plan of a Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly. Um, so Lewis discovered the um, homeotic genes, which are used to help to control the pattern formation in late embryo, larva, and adult stages of the fruit flies. So here is like one of the mutant things that they were working with. Um, so you can see that you have a wild type, which is like a normal fly, and then the mutant one, which you now see legs coming out of its face, which are not, you know, supposed to be there. So there's a mutation that has developed, um, you know, evidently legs where the antennas should be. So this is an, ab an abnormal pattern formation in a fruit fly. So um, mutations in certain regulatory genes called the homeotic genes um, can misplace structures in an animal. And that's what's happening here. So we have a misplacement 
of the legs, they're actually coming out where the antenna should be. Okay, so again, these two scientists studied segment formation. So these are all the different segments of the body. Um, they created mutants, um, conducted breeding experiments, and looked for the corresponding genes. So many of the identified mutations were embryonic lethals, which means that they caused death in the embryos. So any of the mutants that they created, most of them actually killed the fly. But they found about 120 genes that were essential for normal segmentation, which 120 genes for normal segmentation seems like, you know, quite a bit to just kind of create these repeating segmented bodies. Um, so then the axis establishment comes first. So the maternal effect genes encode the cytoplasmic determinants, which we've talked about, that initially established the axes of the body of the drosophila, as we talked about with the uneven distribution and then how mitosis would normally go. And then these maternal effect genes are also called egg polarity genes because they control orientation of the egg and consequently the um, orientation of the fly as it's developing. Um, so we're going to talk about something called bicoid. So um, it's a morphogen determining head structure. So one maternal effect gene, the bicoid gene, um, affects the front half of the body. Okay, so if you think about like why it means like two, so like two sections, like the head and the tail. So those are the two sections that it's kind of referring to. So this is determining like the head, right? Um, so an embryo whose mother has no functional bicoid gene lacks the front half of its body. So that means it doesn't have a head, it has two tails. So it has a duplicate posterior structure at both ends. So instead of having like a head, a body, and then your tail and your little fly wings, I'm so good at drawing. Look at me go, right, with your little antenna. You would just have two tail regions because you're missing the functional bicoid gene. So this is what that looks like, a much better illustration. Um, so you have the wild type fruit fly larva that has a head, three thoracic segments, eight abdominal segments, and then a tail. And then you have a larva whose mother has two mutant alleles of the uh, bicoid gene, has two tails, and lacks all of the anterior structures, which is going to be the one at the bottom that says mutant. Okay, so this phenotype suggested that the product of the mother's bicoid gene is concentrated um, at the future anterior end and is required for setting up the anterior end of the fly. So this hypothesis is an example of the morph morphogen gradient hypothesis. And this basically says that gradients of substances called morphogens establish an embryo's axes and other features, which all has to do with these cytoplasmic determinants that we've been talking about. Um, the bicoid mRNA is highly concentrated at the anterior end. So that's gonna be like towards the head because that's what establishes the head of the embryo. So after the egg is fertilized, the mRNA is translated into the bicoid protein because mRNA turns into protein out of the ribosome, which diffuses from the anterior end. And then the result is a gradient because it's going to diffuse from the anterior end. So this is be like our high concentration and then the tail would be like our low concentration. So obviously this end would become the head and this end would become the tail. Um, the results <clears throat> in a gradient of bicoid protein, like I just explained, um, injection of bicoid RNA, mRNA into various regions of an embryo results in the formation of interior structures at the site of the injection. So this just means that you're able to kind of mutate these flies to express the anterior structures anywhere throughout their little bodies with, with the presence of this new bicoid mRNA that you're introducing. Um, so that's kind of what this picture here is illustrating to you. So you have the... Um, high concentration of our bicoid mRNA in the unfertilized egg. And then obviously that's going to become the anterior, the head of our, um, of our fruit fly. Okay, um, the bicoid research is important for three big reasons. So it identified a specific protein required for some early steps in the pattern formation, like head versus tail. Um, it increased an understanding of the mother's role in embryo development by like solidifying, solidifying the importance of the cytoplasmic determinants. And it demonstrated um, a key developmental principle that a gradient of molecules can determine polarity and position from the embryo. So again, that's like establishing the major axes of an embryo. Okay, the next thing we're gonna be talking about is cloning. Um, so cloning organisms show that differentiated cells could be reprogrammed and ultimately led to the production of stem cells, which we will also talk about. So in organismal cloning, one or more organisms develop from a single cell without meiosis or fertilization. So this is all referring to like, like, like sex, right? Like sexual reproduction. 
typically. So we're not, we're skipping that. We're cloning from one cell, um, from a single cell, right? That you're able to produce one or more organisms. So um, the cloned individuals are genetically identical to the parent that donated the cell. So it's not like they're offspring. It is genetically identical. But remember that it's not like, oh, if you want to clone yourself, like let's say that you're sitting here studying this and you're 17, you're not going to create, boom, there's another 17 year old version of you. It would be an infant, right? Like it would grow up from an embryo to fetus, an infant, and then grow up. So it would be 17 years behind you because it would still have to grow up. Right. So that's how cloning works. It's not just like, boom, here's an identical copy done. We have a very long life cycle as humans. So it would take a long time for your clone to like grow up and be genetically identical to you at this current stage of your life. They'll never be the exact same because they're always going to be younger than you. Um, <clears throat> the current interest in organismal cloning arises mainly from its potential to generate stem cells, which can help with, um, replacing worn out tissues, organs, things like that in the body. And also um, it's a big topic for cancer research. So cloning plants and animals. So FC, um, FC Stewart and his students first cloned whole carrot plants in the 1950s. Plants are a little bit simpler than animals. So that's what they started off with. Um, single differentiated cells from a root incubated in culture medium were able to grow into complete adult plants. Um, this work showed that differentiate, di differentiation is not necessarily irreversible, which is something that was kind of interesting at the time, right? So that it's differentiation is not necessarily irreversible because you're taking a root cell and then you're creating a whole adult plant. So obviously this specialized cell has given rise to other specialized cells so then go on and make the entire plant. Um, so cells that can give rise to all the specialized cells in an organism are called totipotent. Um, so in plants, at least, and mature cells that can de-differentiate and give rise to all of the specialized cells to make up an organism, um, any cell that actually possesses this potential is said to be totipotent because it can create the entire organism. Okay, um, in cloning of animals, the nucleus of an unfertilized egg or zygote is replaced with the nucleus of a differentiated cell. And this is called nuclear transplantation because you're transplanting the nucleus. That makes sense. Um, experiments with frog embryos showed that transplanted nucleus, um, that a transplanted nucleus can often support normal development of the egg. Um, but the older the donor nucleus, the lower the percentage of normally developing tadpoles. So this just means like the older, this is like quote, like the older, the donor nucleus because it's still an embryo, right? So this just means that it is like further, uh, like down the differentiation path, the lower the percentage of normally. So this means that it has like a reduced totipotent potential, the older the nucleus is. Um, so then there's a scientist that can concluded from his work that nuclear potential is restricted uh, as development and differentiation proceeds. So the older um, the nucleus is like the more down the path of differentiation, um, you have a decreased potential um, to create a fully functional organism from that. So this is the experiment that was talked about. So um, at Oxford University, um, if you destroyed the nuclei of a frog egg by exposing it to UV light, um, you can then transplant nuclei from cells of frog embryos and tadpoles into the, the egg that had the nucleus removed, the enucleated egg. And then um, when the transplanted nuclei came from an early embryo, so like a young, quote, younger embryo, whose cells are relatively undifferentiated at that point in development, uh, most of the recipient eggs developed into fully functional tadpoles. But then <clears throat> when the nuclei came from a fully differentiated intestinal cell of a tadpole, like a later cell, fewer than 2% of the eggs developed into fully functional tadpoles. Um, and most of the embryos stopped developing at a much, much earlier stage because these like more differentiated cells don't have um, the potential to be totipotent. And that's essentially the whole experiment here. 
Um, reproductive cloning of mammals. So we're going to look, talk about Dolly. Dolly is a little sheep. So in 1997, Scottish researchers announced the birth of Dolly, a lamb cloned from an adult sheep by nuclear transplantation from a differentiated cell. So Dolly's um, premature death in 2003 and her arthritis led to speculation that her cells were not as healthy we're going to say as healthy as those of a normal sheep, possibly reflecting incomplete reprogramming of the original transplanted nucleus. But Dolly was like a huge, um, huge thing because she's one of the very first mammals that was able to be clumped. Okay, so here's how Dolly was created. So um, basically this method produces cloned animals with nuclear genes identical to those. So like in the nucleus. Um, of the animal supplying the nucleus. So the technique used here, we have the procedure um, to produce Dolly with the first case of a mammal that being cloned um, from a differentiated cell. So basically you have the mammary cell donor, so, and then you have the egg cell donor. So you're going to be removing the nucleus here. So it's actually like none of this DNA right? You're using all of the, the cell donor DNA. So you have the nucleus that you have then inserted into our few cells here, and you have grown those cells up in culture. And you have your early embryo that's going to go through develop. Um, you're going to implant that early embryo into the uterus of another sheep. If you're just implanting the embryo into the uterus, there, there's no DNA involved here either, right? So all the DNA should match the cell donor. It should be a clone of that cell donor into a surrogate mother. And then you have embryonic development go through and you have the birth of a lamb, which is Dolly. It's genetically identical to the mammary cell donor. So essentially you've just taken a desired cell, you fused it with an enucleated egg, the nucleus has gone in and done its job in order to produce an early embryo, which is then implanted and then you have the birth of your clone. Okay, so since 1997, cloning has been demonstrated in many mammals, including mice, cats, cows, horses, mules, pigs, and dogs. A lot of celebrities actually clone their dogs, but then like they get upset when the behavior is different. Like behavior is not part of your DNA. It's like nurture, nature versus nurture sort of thing. Like it's more of like in your upbringing. Anyway, a lot of celebrities clone their dogs and then get pissed off when they're not like the same temperament as their original dog. Anyway, um, one of the famous examples in a cat is called Cece for carbon copy. Um, she was the first cat ever cloned. Um, however, Cece differed somewhat of her female parent, uh, differed somewhat because she's a calico cat. So she actually had the bar body thing happen where like her coloration was somewhat different because it's completely random inactivation of one of those X chromosomes. So she actually did look different from her mom because she's a calico cat. Um, cloned animals do not always look or behave exactly the same as their parent. Um, so we also talked about in like the last section, something called your epigenetics which are largely influenced by like the environment or like diet and things like that. It's not your DNA, but it's small things that influence gene expression in your body. Um, and your behavior, as I just said, is not DNA related, right? And this is also not DNA, but it is um, gene expression. So like if you separate twins at birth and they grow up like on opposite sides of the planet and they have very different um, diets, like they're going to look somewhat different. They will not be identical anymore because your epigenome is actually largely changed. And then also like behavior is largely influenced from like your nurture, like from your environment, right? So you can't actually clone that. Um, we're gonna talk about faulty gene regulation in cloned animals. So in most nuclear transplantation studies, only a small percentage of cloned embryos have developed normally to birth. Um, many cloned animals exhibit defects and sometimes they're pretty significant. Um, epigenetic changes must be reversed in the nucleus um, from a donor animal in order for the genes to be expressed or repressed appropriately for early stages of development, right? So this is what I was talking about. This is basically other things that have influenced how gene expression occurs in an individual. So in order for you to have a true clone, then you'd have to reverse those effects before um, being able to create uh, an appropriate embryo. 
Next, we're going to get into stem cells. So stem cells of animals. Um, a stem cell is relatively is a relatively unspecialized cell. So it's a very early development um, that can reproduce itself indefinitely and differentiate into specialized cells of one or more types. So this cell has a lot of potential to become other types of cells. So stem cells isolated from early embryos at the blastocyst stage. So this is very early on blastocyst stage. This is like before even like the um, placenta has formed, like the precursor cells to the placenta are there, but that's, it's very early on, um, are called embryonic stem cells or ES embryonic stem cells. Um, and they're able to differentiate into all cell types. So that is the advantage of embryonic stem, cell, stem cells because they can differentiate and become literally anything to create an entire organism. Because it's so early on, that makes sense. Um, so then the adult body also has stem cells, uh, which replace non-reproducing specialized cells, which of course don't have the same potential to become any kind of cell because of determination. Um, so here we have like the difference. So this is showing you how stem cells maintain their own population and generate differentiated cells. So um, up towards the top here, we've got a stem cell um, that can divide into another stem cell and a precursor cell or into two stem cells or two precursor cells. Um, and then you have your precursor cells. A pre precursor cell can differentiate into one of many different types of cells, depending on different external factors that will influence what it would become. Um, this example is from a stem cell derived from bone marrow. So you see like different things that can be produced from a bone marrow precursor. Okay, and this image is showing you the um, embryonic stem cells here versus the adult stem cells and kind of the differences between them. So early human embryonic um, stem cells taken from a blastocyst stage. Um, this is what's happening over here. And then on the other side, this is happening from bone marrow. You can see the bone marrow here. That's where we're extracting the adult stem cells from. Um, so when you're working with stem cells, these are some of the different possibilities, embryonic versus adult. So animal stem cells, um, which can be isolated from either the embryonic stem cells or of course our adult tissues um, and grown in different cultures are self-perpetuating so they can replicate um, relatively undifferentiated. So they have the potential to go on and differentiate themselves. Um, embryonic stem cells are easier to grow than adult stem cells and can theoretically, of course, give rise to all types of cells because you're taking them so early from the blastocyst that they haven't been differentiated yet. Whereas the range of cell types that arise from the adult stem cells is not yet fully understood, but it's a lot narrower because you've already gone through determination. Okay, so we're gonna go on to talk about embryonic stem cells and pluripotent. So pluripotent is different from, pluri, uh, from totipotent. So cells that are pluripotent are capable of differ differentiating into many different types of cells. So the de developmental potential of adult stem cells is very limited to certain types of tissues, whereas in our embryonic stem cells, they hold a more promise than the adult stem cells for most medical applications because the um, embryonic, embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. They're capable of differentiating into many different types. Um, the only way for to obtain the embryonic stem cells though is through development of the human embryo and then harvesting them from the human embryo. So they are pluripotent, which can become many different types of cells. And researchers are able to reprogram fully differentiated cells to act like embryonic cells um, using retroviruses, which are viruses that contain RNA. Um, cells transformed this way are called IPS or induced pluripotent stem cells because you have created them, you've induced them to be pluripotent. Okay, so cells of patients suffering from certain diseases can be reprogrammed into IPS cells um, for use in testing potential treatments. So potentially using a patient's own cells, reprogramming them into IPS cells to then be pluripotent and able to re. Uh, differentiate themselves to be their own treatment is like the new cutting edge of like disease treatment and cancer prevention and things like this. I'm um, in the field of regener regenerative medicine, a patient's own cells can actually be reprogrammed into IPS cells to potentially replace the non-functional or diseased cells. So if you can turn off the genes that are being expressed to give them this disease 
and then redifferentiate the cells into creating the types of tissues that need to be replaced then you now have healthy functioning cells, which would be really, truly amazing. Um, next, we're gonna talk about abnormal regulation of genes that affect the cell cycle and can actually lead to cancer. So we've been talking about development, we've been talking about gene expression, how all of this is important, and now gene expression and abnormal regulations can actually lead to cancer. And that all has to stem from um, something going like haywire with the cell cycle. So the gene regulation systems that go wrong during cancer are the same systems involved in embryonic development. So this is important because we've been talking about this the entire time. They're vital that we have them in place and they're functioning correctly in order to develop past our embryonic stages in life. And all of us that are here and listening or recording this have, right? And then um, they're the same ones that can actually cause cancer. The same systems can go awry and actually cause cancer. So there are um, different types of genes associated with cancer. So cancer research uh, led to the discovery of cancer causing genes that are called oncogenes and certain types of viruses. That's where they were first discovered. Um, the normal version of such genes called proto-oncogenes, code for proteins, that's where the proto comes in, proto-proteins, that stimulate normal cell growth and division, normal cell cycle, which is what we need, right? But then when you have a um, some sort of change. So an oncogene arises from a genetic change mutation leading to either an increase in the amount or the activity of the protein product of that gene, right? So now you're either saying um, you're creating too much of it, your cells are growing too much, they're, uh, not, they're not dividing correctly, they're going through the cell cycle too quickly, they're skipping past all of the checkpoints that we've talked about and how they're important for maintaining cell health, things like that. Now you have a genetic change or mutation that has led to the increase in the amount or the activity of the protein of this um, proto-oncogene that now has become an oncogene. Oh no, low battery. Okay, we're gonna try to get through this real fast. Okay, so this image here is basically going through the genetic changes that can occur to turn proto-oncogenes into oncogenes. And because my battery is literally about to die, I'm gonna let you pause and read this. I promise you that it's very simple. It's just basically saying any sort of point mutation will lead to the development of an oncogene, which is now going to be cancerous or lead to a cancerous cell essentially. Okay, so proto-oncogenes can be converted into oncogenes by movement of the oncogene to the position near an active promoter, which may increase transcription, um, amplification, increasing the number of copies of a proto-oncogene, um, or point mutations in the proto-oncogene or its control elements using an increase, causing an increase in gene expression. And all of these were just illustrated in that image up above. Um, tumor suppressor genes encode proteins that help prevent uncontrolled cell growth. Uh, mutations that decrease protein products of tumor suppressor genes may contribute to cancer onset. Our tumor suppressor proteins help to repair damaged DNA, which is important, control cell adhesion, which is important, and inhibit the cell cycle, which of course you want to do if you have cancer present. Um, you have interference with cell signaling pathways, so mutations in the RAS proto-oncogene and P53 tumor suppressor gene are common in human cancers. These are like where a lot of things go wrong and cause cancer. Um, mutations in the RAS gene can lead to production of a hyperactive RAS protein and increased cellular division, which is bad because then you're skipping all the checkpoints and you're going to create cancer. Um, so then this is showing you the normal and mutant cell cycle stimulating pathways. So that kind of just goes with what we just talked about. I'm actually just going to let you look at these images. This is showing you the, um, the first, part, first part with the growth factor. The second one shows you the mutation down here. Suppression of the cell cycle can be important in the case of damage to a cell's DNA. So P53 prevents a cell from passing on mutations due to DNA damage, which is really important. So when you have a mutation of the P53 gene, prevention suppression uh, prevents the suppression of the cell cycle. So when this is actually preventing the cell from passing on these mutations and you have a mutation of the thing that prevents mutations, well, now you have all kinds of mutations. Right, and then this is another image showing you the uh, normal and mutant cell cycling inhibiting pathways. So again, I'm going to let you, this is an inhibitory protein absent and this is with it present. So this stops the cell cycle, this does not stop the cell cycle, this leads to cancer. That's where that mutation comes in. Okay, the multi-step model for cancer development, uh, multiple somatic mutations are generally needed for full-fledged cancer, thus the incidence increases with age. 
Um, the multi-step path to cancer um, is well supported by studies of human colorectal cancer, one of the best understood types of cancer. This is also really scary cancer to have. Uh, the first time colorectal cancer is often a polyp, which you can also get to be benign, a small benign growth on the colon lining. Um, you don't have any symptoms that this exists. You can only tell if you get a colonoscopy, which is uncomfortable because you got to take all those laxatives and you got to stick a camera up your booty. But then you know what? It determines if you have cancer or not. And like, would you rather die? Right? So this is important. Uh, about half a dozen changes must occur to the DNA level uh, for a cell to become fully cancerous. These changes generally include at least one active oncogene and the mutation or loss of several tumor suppressor genes. So it's a whole bunch of different things that actually have to occur for a cell to become cancerous. Um, this is showing you the multi-step model for the development of colorectal cancer. Again, I'm going to let you pause, read these. It's very self-explanatory. Um, inherited predisposition, other factors contributing to cancer. Individuals can inherit oncogenes or multiple alleles for tumor suppressor genes. Basically, you can get these from your parents that are saying like you have a predisposition to getting a cancer. So inherited mutations in the tumor suppressor gene, um, APC, are common in uh, individuals with colorectal cancer. So that's the one that we just talked about. And you've also heard about, um, they call these BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes are found in at least half of the inherited breast cancers. And there's a test to help you uh, sequence your DNA to determine if you have those mutations to start preventative uh, practices. Um, DNA breakage can contribute to cancer, thus the risk of cancer can be lowered by minimizing exposure to agents and damaged DNA, um, such as ultraviolet radiation, chemicals found in cigarettes and smoke, and other uh, carcinogens, of course. Also, viruses play a role in about 15% of human cancers by um, donating an oncogene to the cell, because remember, these were initiated in viruses, disrupting a tumor suppressor gene or converting proto-oncogenes um, into oncogenes. And that's where we get a lot of HPV from. So make sure that you get that Gardasil vaccine. Am I right? Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off before my battery dies. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next one.